with Food Allergy. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its education outreach program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Vice President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America Kids with Food Allergies Division. I have the privilege of being your moderator again today. Presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers without compensation. On behalf of KFA, I'm very grateful for Laurel to donate her time to be here with us. I have some housekeeping details to run through before we get started. First of all, um, today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship by Mylan Specialty. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Mylan Specialty for the financial support that enables us to develop education programs for families. Next, please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only is, and is neither medical nor legal advice. You should consult your own physician and attorney for any specific advice you seek with regard to your own child. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. Everyone in the audience is in listen-only mode. However, you can type your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will try to answer them later. Um, and we will be having a question and answer session towards the end if we do have time. Uh, Laurel's already gotten a lot of questions submitted in advance, and so she'll be starting with those. Later in today's webinar, we'll stop to give away two copies of Colette Martin's new uh, cookbook, The Allergy-Free Pantry, Make Your Own Staple Snacks and More Without Wheat, Gluten, Dairy, Nuts, Soy, or Eggs. The recipients of these gifts will be picked randomly from whoever's in the audience towards the end of this webinar. And at the end of the webinar, you will see a survey, so share your impressions with us. We always um, like to know what you like and what you don't like, and it helps us with future programming. Uh, Laurel's got lots of questions to answer today, so I'm not going to dwell on my intro anymore, and we're just going to move right on to going through some polls that Laurel will present, and then she'll get started. Thank you. Thanks, Laurel, for joining us today. Thank you, Linda. I'm glad to be here. So our first poll is, I am attending as a, and then select one, parent, educator, or school administrator, school nurse, healthcare professional, or other. And we can see the results. The majority of you are parents at 86%. We have some educators um, or school administrators, some uh, school nurses and healthcare professionals. And uh, so that's good. So our next poll question is, if you have a student with food allergies, what is the age of that student? Is it preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, or not applicable? And we have the majority is elementary school at 52%, um, a lot of preschoolers at 30%, some middle schoolers and high school, and some not applicable. And our last question, does your student have a Section 504 plan, meaning have one currently? Yes, no, have started the process but not complete, have an IHCP instead, which is another type of plan, um, or not applicable. And the majority, well not the majority, but 45% do not have a plan, 12% um, have started the process, 16% do have a plan, 5% have an IHCP instead, and 22% not applicable. Well thank you for taking the time to answer those questions. And um, what I wanted to do is to give just a brief description of 504 and how it differs from a health care plan, um, just so that when we get to the questions, um, we'll all be uh, understanding basically what, uh, what I'm talking about and what the differences are. So an individualized health care plan, and it comes with many names. That's just one name. Sometimes it's called a care plan, um, individualized plan, all kinds of names. Um, but basically what it is, it's, that is a, an agreement that you make with the school nurse. And it's an informal process where you sit down with the school nurse and you talk about things that the school can do to make life easier for the food allergic child so that they can be safe and included. Um, but that is basically a, 
it's not a binding agreement. It's basically just something that you come to um, an agreement with your school nurse. It doesn't have complaint procedures involved with it. Um, it's not legally blinding, binding, and you don't have to have a documented disability to get that. But it does list the accommodations that you and the school nurse and perhaps maybe even the principal have agreed to. In contrast, 504 plan is a federally plan, federally mandated plan under federal law, and this is a formal process. There are complaint procedures in place. There's a specific way you go about getting a 504. It is legally binding. The key to getting a 504 is you must have a documented disability, um, but it also lists accommodations. Sometimes a 504 plan can look exactly the same as an IHCP. They can have the exact same provisions. It's just the 504 is more formal. Um, and another key to 504 is the school that your child attends must get federal funds. So this applies to all public schools. Some private schools that if you can find some source of federal funding, um, it applies, but that's another key is in order to qualify for 504, your school must get federal funds. So next slide, please. So again, 504 is a federal law, and it comes from the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And it basically says that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the U.S. shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity, and here's the key, receiving federal financial assistance. So again, that just uh, reiterates that your school must have some source of federal funding in order for uh, you to qualify for a 504 plan. So under a 504 plan, you have to show that your child has a disability. And this is the definition of disability. It's a person who has a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities or has a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. The key here is that it limits a major life activity. It's not the ability to learn. Some schools get this mixed up because the the qualification for getting an IEP um, for special education is that it affects the student's ability to learn. 504 is different. It's a separate law. It has nothing to do with your ability to learn. So what, what can happen is sometimes parents or students will say, well, my child is an all-A student, um, so he doesn't qualify for a 504 plan. That's not the standard. The standard is, does your child have a life activity? And what a life activity is, something like breathing, eating, um, the circulatory system of your body. Um, so basically, food allergies can fall under that it affects the major life activity of eating, breathing, uh, and so forth. Now, food allergies are usually considered a disability. Um, the burden is actually on the parent to show that it follows this definition. Um, but nine times out of 10, the school is going to recognize that your child with a food allergy has a disability and you will qualify for the plan. So next. So there are specific components to the 504 law. The first is child find and what this means is that every program that gets federal assistance has a duty to find students who they think may qualify for 504. So your school has actually has to look for students who they think may qualify. Um, the next is you have evaluation, which is a meeting um, to determine whether the child is eligible. And at that point, you can bring in all kinds of evidence. Um, there's no restriction on what you can bring in. You certainly, at the minimum, have to have a, a doctor's note or diagnosis. But you can bring in whatever other um, evidence you have to show that your child has food allergies or whatever condition you're saying qualifies for the disability. Um, and then they have to find placement for the child and accommodations. Um, the accommodations is what we'll talk about a lot today. We'll give you some specifics and talk about um, how those come about and so forth. But that's the key is basically if the school determines that your child has a disability and qualifies, then they must make accommodations so that your child can be safe and included in the program. Next is due process. 504 has a very stringent process. Um, in fact, when you request your 504 meeting, you're supposed to be getting a document from the school outlining your rights under 504. Um, and there also is a process that you can 
um, appeal your case. There's supposed to be an internal school district um, appellate process. Uh, most parents don't use that because it's internal to the school, but the school has to have a grievance procedure. Um, and lastly, under 504, it coincides with the concept of FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education. And for students with disabilities, this means that the educational program has to be designed to meet the needs of students with disabilities as adequately as it meets the needs of the non-disabled. Okay, so next slide. Um, so what is the procedure for getting a 504? So here's one of the first questions we received. Um, my son is starting kindergarten in the fall, and I want to put together a 504 plan, but don't know where to start. OK, so if we could go back to the slide. OK, so the first thing you need to do is you need to put in writing um, that you are requesting a formal 504 meeting. That goes to the principal and to the district's 504 coordinator. Every school district has to have somebody designated as the 504 coordinator for the district. Sometimes it's the principal, uh, and sometimes it's a separate person. But you want to send a letter, and the letter is very basic. There's no formality about it at all. You basically just say, I am requesting uh, an official meeting under 504 because I believe my child has a disability, which qualifies. Um, and then they have a reasonable time to get back to you to schedule that meeting. The law is very vague on uh, the timing. Um, usually what happens is the schools look to the rules for IEPs. So in other words, if the IEP rule says you have to have your IEP meeting within 30 days, then they apply that to 504. Uh, but they don't have to. It's, it's, it's a reasonable time. Um, then next, you really need to have a written diagnosis from your doctor. So you need to present that when you go to the meeting. And also, um, I say when you first approach that meeting, who, now who's going to be there? It's going to be the principal, the 504 coordinator, um, could be the nurse, could be the school teacher. Um, th those are usually the main, and of course, obviously, the parents have the right to be there. Um, so when you go to that meeting, so you've given the letter, you've gotten your written diagnosis, you're going to attend the meeting. I tell people to have certain accommodations in mind that you want to present at the meeting that you think will help your child. Um, and you can use the CDC guidelines. Um, if you just Google CDC voluntary food allergy guidelines, you'll find the link to that. Or some states have guidelines. And that can give you an idea of some accommodations that you can propose. But remember, this is a, a mutual meeting. It's sort of um, a compromise. So you'll come into the meeting and you'll have certain things that you'd like to propose. The school will then either propose its things or tell you what they agree or disagree with in your proposal. And it's basically a compromise between you and the school to figure out what is the best way to handle the allergy. So if you go to the next slide. Where do I get the forms for a Section 504? Are they specific for each state or is it a federal form? No, there are actually no forms for 504. Um, each school does it differently. Um, some schools may have a template that they like to use. Other schools don't have anything at all. Um, and it's not specific to the, to the state because this is a federal uh, law that this falls under. But there's no official form of what it has to look like. Um, if you want an idea of what some looks like, KFA does have some 504 plans. Um, on its site, and if you go to the KFA Kids with Food Allergies website, you can see samples of Section 504 plans. Um, and also, I, to give myself a little plug, I have a software program that will help you draft your own 504 at Green Laurel. Um, but basically, there's no set form. It's up to you and the school to come together and create the form. Now, there are certain things that the form is going to have. It's going to list your child, list the allergies list the reason for um, why the child qualifies for a 504, and then it's going to list the accommodations. Um, the next thing is signing. Um, really, the only people that need to sign are the parents and the 504 coordinator. Um, those are the only two that, that have to sign it to make it legally binding. Um, the teacher does not have to sign. She, is, she or he is not part of the 504 process. Again, they may be at the meeting and they may weigh in, um, but they don't have to sign the, 
the form in order for it to be valid. So next slide. My son is enrolled in a virtual school, but we hope to transition to brick and mortar by fourth grade. Is it better to have the 504 in place before we move to a physical school? The answer is no. Uh, you can't do a 504 plan unless you know where the child is going to be. You've already arranged for the meeting at the school. It, it's really something that has to be done right before you, the school starts, and it has to be a collaborative process. So you can't have it in place before you even know where your child is going to be, because you have no idea what the layout's going to be, what their policies already are. Um, it really is something that is a collaborative process that you do with the school, and you just can't do it before you even know where you're going to school. Um, so next slide, please. My child is in preschool, and I want to learn more about the 504 plans that might currently be in place at our local public school. How can I find that information? You can't. This is, this is uh, protected by privacy. There's a special law, FERPA, which protects students' health records and stu student um, diagnoses. Um, so there's absolutely no way you can find out who in your district has a 504 plan. The school cannot give that information out. They will not give that information out. And, and likewise, you wouldn't want them to be talking to other parents about your own 504 plan or your own child. So likewise, they cannot tell you. So they can't even tell you we have 20 kids on a 504 plan. They can't tell you anything about anyone else's 504 plan. So there's no way you're going to find that information out, unfortunately. Next slide. Is it important to have the 504 in place if our school is cooperating with our requests? Well, what I'm going to say here is that you don't always need a 504. Um, I know this may be um, controversial, but for some people, just having an IHP is enough. Um, some schools have amazing policies already in place that protect students with food allergies. And um, some parents say, gee, I, I like the way the school does things. I like that they follow the policy. Um, and in that case, maybe just having an IHP, um, uh, you know, the informal agreement with the, the nurse is enough. Um, and some parents are afraid that if they request the 504, they might come off as being uh, seen as being, you know, a pain in the neck or causing problems or that kind of thing. So I know there are some parents who don't go for the 504 plan, and that's okay. You don't have to. Um, if they're cooperating, you still can get the 504. Um, and in that case, what I would do is I would go to the school, and if you're, if you're already happy with what they're doing, uh, I would basically say, look, we're, I like what you're doing. You understand it. You get it. You're doing the right things. Can we just put something in writing so that we're all on the same page and that there are no misunderstandings? Um, and that way, you can sort of get the school to put down in writing um, what they're agreeing to do without having to say, well, I'm one of 504, and this is my right. And, um, because you, you know, that, that's a, a, an important relationship that you have with the school personnel. So if they're already being cooperative and you're happy with what they're doing, but you feel you need um, that extra protection, then I would just approach it that way and say, look, I'm happy with what we're doing, but just so that there's no confusion and everybody's on the same page, uh, I'd like to request a 504, and then that 504 can have in it what the school is already doing um, so that you don't have to worry about renegotiating. So that's how I would answer that one. Next slide. Is it legal to ask for your child's classroom to be peanut free? Yes, it is legal to ask. You can ask. Um, asking doesn't mean you will receive, though. Um, you have to show um, that, uh, that uh, the way to keep your child safe is to be in a peanut-free classroom. And there are certain factors that go into that, like the age of the child. Usually, the younger the child, the better case you can make for the room to be peanut-free, because younger children tend to touch things and touch their eyes and their faces more and tend to be sloppier with the food products and stuff. 
Um, it also depends on the setup of your school. There was a famous Massachusetts case called the Mystic Valley Charter case where the school ate in the classrooms. They didn't have a cafeteria. Um, and so in that case, the, the uh, ruling was the entire school was peanut free, but that was because it was a small school. There wasn't a cafeteria and the child was having reactions eating in the classroom. Um, so really a lot of factors come into it. Uh, again, the, the setup of the school, the size of the school, um, and that kind of thing. Um, another thing is also whether this is something that your doctor supports. Um, a lot of parents will have their doctors write the child must be in a peanut-free classroom. Um, the school then takes that and um, evaluates that along with all the other evidence. Um, I just want to say to parents that um, schools have been, this is, tends to be the trend now, hiring their own doctors um, to uh, evaluate your child or evaluate the records. Um, and they have the right to do that. Um, so just be prepared that um, this is, it may not happen in every school, but it tends to be, that seems to be the trend now of schools hi having their own doctors come in and weigh in on what they think. Uh, and in that case, you know, again, just have your doctor write what your child needs and make the argument that this is what your child needs, if that's what you're requesting. Um, and again, no, no one piece of evidence is going to be weighted more than another. So they can't say, well, the doctor's advice is going to be the end all and be all. Again, it's a collaborative process looking at all of the evidence. Um, so again, whatever evidence you can bring in if you're requesting a peanut-free room, um, that would be important to bring as much as you can to make that argument. But again, it's, they don't have to make it peanut-free. Just be aware. But if you can make the argument that it should be, then, um, then it will be. So, next slide. How are food allergies handled on the bus? Okay, if we go, go to the next slide. So, the bus ride to and from school is considered part of the school day. So, if your child needs accommodations um, for food allergies, then they have to have accommodations on the bus. The tricky part is that bus companies may be third-party contractors with the school. So, what will happen is you'll sit with the principal and say, well, I really want um, the bus driver to do X, Y, and Z. And then the principal will come back and say, well, we don't control the bus drivers. They have their own company. We pay them separately. They're not our employees. We don't have control over them. This is a big issue with uh, a lot of schools. But under 504, that ride to and from the school is still considered part of the school day. So the school does have to make accommodations. So they have to find a way to work it out with the bus drivers. Some states, I know Massachusetts now has a sta uh, state law pending about epinephrine on school buses. So um, if you're having trouble, maybe look to see what your state has any laws or regulations about epinephrine on buses. Um, but here are some sample accommodations that might be helpful. Um, ask that your child always sit in the front seat. Ask that your child be allowed, if it's age appropriate, to carry his epinephrine and a cell phone. You may also request that an aide be on the bus. Um, and you may also request that the driver wipes down the seats, or all the seats, or even just the one seat that your child is assigned to sit in before coming on the bus. Um, and then again, you know, hopefully the bus driver will be trained in how to use epinephrine. Um, if not, then you can make the argument you definitely need an aide on the bus who does know how to give epinephrine. Um, so those are some of the, the things, but just be aware that the schools may say it's going to be a little harder because they don't have as much control over the bus drivers as they do the other employees. So next. How are food allergies handled on field trips? Field trips are also considered part of the school day. So again, the school has to um, accommodate field trips. So somebody had asked what, what I suggest as sample accommodations for field trips. Well, one, I would say no eating on the bus. I know sometimes for field trips, they say, oh, we don't have time. We'll just have all the kids eat their peanut butter sandwiches on the bus. Um, I would say I, I, I don't want that. I want the kids to be seated outside or um, so that you can segregate the children, um, you know, 
if you need to segregate them from the people eating food allergy or products containing food allergens. Um, a parent be allowed to chaperone. They cannot make it mandatory that you chaperone, um, but um, one thing I like to request is that the parent have the option to be the chaperone, um, so that if the parent wants to, then the parent is allowed to be there. Um, hands washed or wiped after eating. Um, this again is important because when you're on a field trip, you're, you're doing things not normally done in the school, you have less control over the environment. So just asking the kids to either, if there's a sink available, wash their hands or to maybe just wipe their hands after they eat is important. You also have to make sure somebody who is responsible is there with the epinephrine that um, either the um, school uh, nurse accompany them, which sometimes happens, sometimes not. You want to make sure that there is somebody who is uh, responsible for administering the epinephrine in case your child needs it and also cell phone. And now, so I put here watch 911. Why I put that is because some people um, don't realize that when you call 911 from a cell phone, at least this used to be the case, maybe now with smartphones and GPS it's better, but um, it used to be the case that your call would not go to the local fire department. Um, for instance, in Massachusetts, if you call 911 on a cell phone, your phone goes to the police barracks in Framingham, Massachusetts. And that could be near where you are, it could be far from where you are. Um, and then what happens is then they have to find out where you are and then they redirect the call to the appropriate EMS in that town. So that takes time. Um, and if time is, time is your enemy, you want to be able to get this done quickly. So what I tell parents is if you know the town that your child is going to for the field trip, um, it, it, I mean, you don't have to, but just if you want extra peace of mind, figure in your mind where the nearest hospital is or where the nearest police department is and have that number handy. So that way, if they have to call 911 and say you're in the middle of a forest or something on a field trip, um, that you can call either directly the hospital or the local police. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, 1212 is uh, the number that you can get the always can get the local police with the if, so if you dial the area code and you know the um, first three digits of the the area 1212 is uh, always a sign for police so for instance um, in my town the first number is always 781 so if I wanted to just call the police I would call 781 you know 1212. Um, but anyway, but again, you don't have to. I mean, again, maybe with GPS, cell phones are better now, but that used to be the problem. And so I would just say it just for peace of mind to have a number handy that, so that you don't waste time uh, having it to be redirected. So next slide. Somebody asked about what um, accommodations would be appropriate for the lunchroom. Um, there are several. And again, it really... It really is individual for the child, for the school setup. So again, these are just suggestions. It may not be appropriate for how your school works, but these tend to be um, some of the ones that um, the parents consider. An allergen-free, or now they use the word allergen-friendly table. Um, so you, or some schools actually do an allergen table, so that the students who are eating the peanut butter have to sit at one table. Um, but usually it's an allergen-free or allergen-friendly table where the child with food allergies um, sits and there'll be no allergens at that table. Um, so if you do have that allergen-free table, you want to make sure that that table is washed with a dedicated bucket and a sponge, an approved cleaner. Um, so you don't want them wiping all of the tables that just had peanut butter and then taking that rag and dumping it in the bucket and then washing the peanut-free table, for instance, with that rag. Um, so I'd ask that be put in there, that is specifically you have a dedicated bucket, a dedicated sponge for the table. Do not allow that table to be used for after school events unless it's labeled. Um, so you could have an a allergen free table throughout the school day, everything's perfect. And then at night the Cub Scouts come in and they make peanut butter um, birdhouses and they use the allergen table, the allergen free table because they didn't realize now the table is contaminated. 
Um, so ask the school to either properly label the table so that outside groups know that that's going to be an allergen-free table, or some schools they can push the tables up. Um, for my school, they would push the, the uh, allergen-free table up um, into the wall where they have those just chairs that go into the wall um, so that for after-school activities, everybody would know they're not allowed to use that table. Um, buffer zone. This is something that comes up with a lot of children who have milk allergies who are afraid that um, even at an allergen-free table, there may be people who have milk or milk products um, because milk is so prevalent at school. Um, so you may say, I want a buffer zone. I want the people sitting immediately next to my child not to be drinking milk or having milk products. Um, that's something that's also commonly done. Uh, make sure if you do the allergen-friendly table that the child is, in, is entitled to bring friends to the table. You don't want your child sitting alone and being ostracized at that table. Um, some schools go so far as to have an aide watch the table or a lunchroom monitor um, to make sure that nobody brings in allergens to the allergen-free table. Um, that's another thing. And also, just uh, a side note, um, with the federal lunch program, if your school participates in this, um, you're entitled to have a meal of equivalent um, nutritional value that's safe for your child. Um, you do need a special doctor's note for this. Um, but So in other words, if they're serving macaroni and cheese and you want your child to participate in the federal lunch program but they can't eat the macaroni and cheese, they have to offer your child an allergen-free uh, lunch of equivalent nutritional value. So they can't, for instance, say, oh, well, we're not going to just give you an apple. Um, and the other kids will have a three course meal, they have to make it the same nutritional value as the other meals. But then that, you, again, you do need a special doctor's note um, to get that. So next, next question. What about PTO events and assemblies? Assemblies are definitely considered part of the school day, so they do have to accommodate for assemblies. PTO the trend has been to consider the PTO part of the school day and PTO must accommodate. Um, what the test is, is that the program that you need, you're asking whether it's part of 504 has to get either direct or indirect financial support from the school. They have to be using tangible resources from the school. Um, would have to get recognition and approval from the school, and then they would consider whether it's a permanent or long-term part of the school day. So, for instance, with PTOs, um, the money may come from the parents, um, but a lot of PTOs are allowed to use the school's buildings for free, or sometimes they get a discount if they have to rent it. So that would be the school providing um, a direct or an indirect financial support. Um, again, tangible resources, schools allow them to use their tables. Um, oftentimes, principals or teachers go to the PTO meetings. Um, some schools make it mandatory, so again, that would bring the PTO in. Um, the school usually advertises the PTO events um, to, their, to the school district, usually on, sometimes on school district letterhead. So again, that's again, another way to bring the PTO in. Um, and usually, PTO events are permanent. It's something that happens all the time. It's not just a one-time deal. So if that's the case, and you can make that argument, um, which in most cases you can, and again, that's the trend, is that PTO events are considered part of the school day, then the PTO has to follow your accommodation plan. Um, it's very, I know it's hard because with PTO you're dealing with outside parents, but really it comes back to the school. It's the school's responsibility to make sure um, that those PTO events are inclusive. So if we can go to the next slide. I just wanted to point out the um, National PTA Association has a resolution about food allergy in schools, um, and they have several resources, um, but they have this resolution that you can find on their website. Um, so if you are having problems with your PTA or PTO, um, this might be something you want to download and bring because it's, again, sort of suggestions from the National PTA Association of how PTAs and PTOs should, um, should deal with food allergies. Um, allergyhome.org is also a great resource. It has a lot of information. Um, it's sort of written in, in an uh, easy-to-understand way, 
So you, maybe you could print some of those resources and share them with the other PTO parents. Um, and lastly, um, this is a uh, the National Education Association's Health Info Network, um, and they have a video for that's designed for educators talking about food allergy. Um, it's kind of written in a like a car cartoon fashion, um, but that's another resource to help um, to educate other parents who may not understand the food allergies. So next question. Where can I find food allergy policies for the district? So next slide. So schools that participate in the federal lunch program were mandated to create wellness policies. So these are policies on how they will regulate uh, sugar and activity levels of students, basically how they're going to uh, keep their students well. A lot of schools in that wellness policy have put in food allergy policies. So um, if you're not sure where to start, a good place to start may be to go to your district and ask, um, can I see the wellness policy that the school has? And again, it's got to have one. It's got to be open to the public. Um, and if you ask, they have to provide it. And so a lot of schools will handle wellness policies that way. Um, if you're if you're having some, some trouble or maybe your school is, doesn't know how to create a policy for food allergies, um, there are some references, the CDC guidelines, which we talked about earlier. Um, some states have guidelines for what should be in, in their uh, school's policies. So these are just a few examples. New Jersey has state guidelines. Massachusetts has state guidelines. Pennsylvania has state guidelines. So um, that's another place to look. And they may say, OK, each school should have this, that, and the other policy. Usually they're voluntary um, and not mandatory, but again, it's a good place to start um, if, if you're having trouble finding out what policies your school has or your school is having trouble deciding what uh, policies it should have. So next. If there is no nurse, who can give epinephrine? OK, so next, next slide. So, Every state has laws and regulations about designation or delegation of medicines. Um, and they vary. So some states require school nurses to train people. Um, it, it really varies from state to state. But the key thing is that every state does have a law or regulation determining who can be delegated the responsibility of giving epinephrine. So um, if you can do some research um, about your state to find out um, what those regulations are. Um, stock epinephrine, um, so this is happening in a lot of states, and um, so if there is stock epinephrine in your school, if they are mandated to carry it, again, there has to be a procedure for who can give it. So um, that may be another um, avenue to find out um, whether, you know, who in the school is allowed to be uh, designated to, to use epinephrine. Uh, I say Good Samaritan laws because this is something to keep in mind that all states have them. So we're basically saying that if anybody who renders renders uh, aid in good faith, um, then they're usually protected from liability. So if, for instance, your teacher is nervous about the epinephrine, you can say, well, hey, you're protected. So um, even if you make a mistake, the law protects you. So that may give them some more incentive. Um, but the key thing is make sure you have an emergency care plan. This differs from the 504 plan and the IHCP in that it's usually about a one-page document that outlines what to do when an emergency happens. So it will say, if my child is exhibiting these symptoms, then you must give epinephrine, you must call 911, you must call these numbers. Um, so that is a very important plan, and that plan is signed by your own doctor, um, and that's very important to have so that whoever is giving epinephrine in your school understands the procedure. Um, so at the very least, the teacher should um, understand what's in the emergency care plan, and obviously the school nurse. Um, but that's something very important, because in an emergency, people sometimes freeze, they don't know what to do, and having something written that they can rely on is very, very helpful. Um, there was also a question about substitute teachers, and it's very important that substitutes get a copy 
of both your child's 504 and that emergency care plan before they start the day. So in my son's uh, 504, we had written in that substitutes would have to go to the front office and pick up a folder about my child before they went into the classroom. Uh, and again, that's something you can request in your 504, but again, you want to make sure that if a substitute teacher comes in, they're not blindsided halfway through the school day. Um, you want to make sure that that information is shared with them um, right up front. So next, uh, next slide. What happens when I move to a new school or state? Well, if you have a 504 plan in place at your school and you move out of the district or you move to another state, that plan follows you. So if you go to the new district and the district looks at the plan and says, we think this is an appropriate plan, then they have to implement it as is. The school can look at it, however, and say, well, this really isn't appropriate for our setup because they may have a different way of doing things than the other school. Um, so if that's the case, what they have to do is they have to follow the plan until they have a meeting to establish a new plan. And that meeting should happen within 30 days of arriving at the new school. Um, and at that meeting, it's basically you're, you're having the 504 meeting all over again, um, and you start again. Um, but in the meantime, they have to follow the other school's plan until they have a chance to sit down with you and create a new plan. Uh, and again, if they like the plan that you already have, then they, can, they implement it the way it is and nothing happens. It's just as if you were at the same school. But usually schools are going to want to tweak it because they may have a different way of doing things than the other school. Um, so they do have 30 days to schedule that meeting with you to change the plan. Next. What do you say when your school says, we don't do 504s for allergies? Common, common question. Basically, you say to the school, if it's a public school or if it's a private school that you've already determined gets federal funding, you say, sorry, that's not the answer. You have to. It's, a, it's federal law. Uh, again, the public school districts have that child find requirement where they have to actively find children who they think may qualify for 504. So they cannot say we don't do 504 for allergies. They just can't. Uh, they have to. Um, now, what you have to realize is that when a school makes accommodations for your child under 504, they don't get money for that. So they have to find the money somehow, some way. So a lot of schools are reluctant to do 504s because they, they say, well, well it's going to really hurt our budget or whatever. But that, that's not good enough. Um, they have to still do it. If they get federal money, then they have to have a 504. And if they don't, then you go, and uh, we'll talk a little later about what your remedies are, but you go and you, you complain and um, say your child has to be evaluated. So next, next slide. Our daughter's school has not put any of our requests into her 504 plan. They made up their own, and we do not agree. What do we do? Okay. Again, remember, this is supposed to be a collaborative process. They can't basically say, here's the plan, this is it, boom, that's all we're doing. You have to, it has to be a back and forth process. So what I would say is if, if you don't agree, then the first thing to do is to put a letter to the school saying you don't agree and that you would like to have another evaluation meeting and that you're not going to agree to the plan until you've had another meeting. So really try to sit down again with the school and go over it and say why it's not right, what needs to be changed, um, and how it, why it's, it, it's necessary for your child. Um, if they refuse and they still uh, hold steady, um, then what you want to do is the next page is to file a complaint with the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. Um, the website used to be uh, a lot easier to find, but they now made it with uh, all these little uh, slashes and things to find the OCR. Um, but that's, that's where it is. You can Google again, Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights. And they divide the country up into districts, and they have uh, people who you can talk to um, about your rights. And, um, and if the school really is, is being stubborn and not, not working with you, then you can file a complaint there. 
Um, you can also try your state board of education. Um, sometimes uh, states will have a, a due process uh, system set up where you can uh, make a complaint with your state board of education. So that's another way to, uh, to go. Um, your last thing is you can file a, a case in federal court. Um, I don't advise it because that's really bringing the big guns. That's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, if you can work with the school, that's the best. Um, but you always do have that right to, to file a case in federal court. So next slide. Any ideas for accommodations at preschool? Okay, next. So, yeah, I have a lot, a lot of ideas for um, preschool. Um, preschools falling under 504 is, is tricky. Um, technically, a child cannot have a 504 until they're age three. Um, they can have a 504 younger than age three if education is mandatory in your state for kids under three. So for instance, if your school system says all kids who are 2.9 have to be in preschool, um, then your 2.9 year old will qualify for a 504. Um, but usually the cutoff is age three. Um, also, again, it's the federal funding. Um, so the preschool has to have some source of federal funding. With preschool, it's a little different than elementary school. Um, there can be some indirect ways of getting funding. Um, for instance, Head Start program. Um, so it's a, it's a little more tricky. But basically, preschools do have to fall under the ADA. And the ADA, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act, is similar to 504 in that it helps disabled children have equal access. A little different standard than 504, um, but also under, under the ADA, the school has to make what are called reasonable modifications to the program. So that's similar to accommodations. Um, the one exception is preschools that are controlled by religious affiliations. So a parochial school's preschool is not subject to 504, or one that's run by uh, a religious organization is not uh, under either 504 or, well, it could be under 504 if it gets federal funding, but it's not under ADA. So those are a little harder to work with. But the regular preschool is either going to fall under 504 or ADA. So in that case, you want um, some accommodations. People who are living in Massachusetts, for instance, Massachusetts has a regulation that specifically says all preschoolers with food allergies have to have a health care plan. Um, so again, your state may say something to, along those lines if you can try to see what the laws are pertaining to your state. Um, but so but the bottom line is you're probably going to be getting some kind of accommodations at your preschool, either if you can get it under ADA or 504. So here are some suggestions. One of the most important things is to ask the school to have a separate eating area, keep it separate from the play and learning areas. Um, preschools usually don't have a cafeteria, um, so they have to designate a, a, a separate eating area um, because, again, you're dealing with young children who tend to spill, who tend to smear things on other surfaces. Um, so one of the most important things is to ask the school if they can make sure that when the kids eat, it's in a separate area from where they have the play and learning area. Washing hands is very important in preschool. There was a study that said preschoolers touch their mouth or their eyes 40 times an hour. So this is something that we know preschoolers do a lot. And if they get something, an allergen on their hand, and they lick their hand or they touch their eye, they can have a reaction. So it's very, very important in preschool that the kids learn hygiene and washing their hands. Um, it's important to educate other children about food allergies um, at an age-appropriate level so that they understand uh, why their classmate has to do certain things or why they're being asked to do certain things. There are a lot of good books out there. Um, Kyle Dine has uh, CDs with children's songs to teach children. Um, so uh, that's very important. Next is to make sure that whoever's in charge of the preschool is OK with using EpiPens, label reading, and cross-contamination. Now, why do I point those three things out? 
because there was a study of preschoolers and reactions, and they found the three causes that they could identify the most, uh, the, the most uh, frequent causes of reactions were failure of the preschool to give epinephrine, failure of somebody to correctly read a label, and failure to prevent cross-contamination. So those are three issues that you really want to make sure that your preschool understands. That they, use ep and they know how to use epinephrine and will use it when appropriate. That they understand label reading, because again, the children are too young to read their own labels. So somebody has to be educated at the school about label reading. And they also have to be, uh, understand about cross-contamination. Um, another thing you can ask to make sure that the crafts be free of allergens. Again, KFA has a wonderful handout about this, talking about allergens that are in preschool activities. Um, so go to the KFA website, and that's a, a very helpful handout. You can print it out and present it to your preschool. Um, also, the staff should understand that young children describe reactions differently. So they don't understand anaphylaxis the way an adult does. They may say things like, my throat feels funny, or um, I feel like there's a lump in my throat, or something. Um, so the staff has to understand that there are different words that young children use to describe reactions. Um, the staff also should learn that when they um, educate the other children about food allergies to be careful with the words they choose, to not say um, Johnny can die, to make sure that they don't overly scare the kids when they talk about food allergies. Um, so some people actually put that in the plan too to say, um, these are the words I want you to use to describe food allergy to other kids. Um, and also, they have to tell kids not to share food. One of the big concepts in preschool is teaching children to share. But with food allergies, you don't want them sharing food. So you want the, the preschool to be able to tell the children it's OK not to share food, and that this is a variation from the usual sharing rules that preschools um, enforce. So. That's just um, a few places to start, again, with accommodations. Um, again, each situation is unique, but um, this, is, this would be a good start. Uh, next section. What is the best way to make sure your kid is safe at school? Then we go to the next slide, which is have an agreement in writing. It doesn't have to be a 504 plan. It can be an IHCP. But whatever you have with the school, it has to be in writing. Um, I know sometimes you think, OK, we, you have a meeting with the nurse, and the nurse understands, and everything is, uh, is going well. But you really have to have something in writing. One, because you want to make sure that what you have said to them, they understand, and they're not thinking of something else, or something totally different. Two, when the substitutes come in, there has to be something for them to review. Um, and three, you also want it in writing for other teachers, like, for instance, the band teacher, um, the gym teacher. Um, so the, the safest way to keep your child safe is to have whatever agreements you've made in writing so that everybody's on the same page, everybody's clear, there are no mistakes, there's no misunderstandings. It's there in black and white. Um, so the next slide. What is the best way to send a teenager off to college with multiple life-threatening allergies? Well, in college, um, if they get federal funding, they do have to abide by 504. Um, they may also have to abide by um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the difference at college is colleges have a different standard than elementary schools. This is because college education is not mandatory, like um, elementary and middle school and high school is mandatory. So um, colleges are given a little more flexibility. So they can argue that what you're asking, if it, uh, if it amounts to what they call a fundamental alteration of their program, or if it causes them an undue burden, usually a financial burden, then they have the ability to say no to those accommodations. So um, just be aware that in college, it's a different standard. Um, than an elementary school, but you still are entitled, if your child has a disability, to a 504 plan if they get federal funds. Um, it's just you may not be entitled to all of the accommodations that you had in the earlier levels, but they still have to. Um, schools should have a disability department that you can go and talk to um, and ask what kind of accommodations, like for instance for their cafeteria and so forth. Um, another issue to think about with uh, teenagers in college 
is um, access to medical records. So once a child turns 18, then the parent no longer has access to their records. So what you want to do is ask your child to sign a document saying that you have the right to access their records. Um, because if you don't have something in writing saying that you have that permission, then for instance, if your child has a reaction and you're not listed as uh, a person that they're authorized to talk to, you won't know anything. Um, so make sure that's done ahead of time. Um, you could, and there are various ways you could do that, uh, healthcare proxy, um, or just you know having a, a one-page agreement, or working something out with a school on their medical forms to say that you have you have permission. But just realize that if your child is over 18 and has a reaction and goes to a hospital, say out of out of state, for instance, um, and you haven't put something in writing, you have no right to get those records. So make sure you do that ahead of time. Um, and I think that's all the questions that we had submitted. Um, I don't know if we have time to take some others. Um, well, thanks, Laurel. It's about four minutes before two. So I think what I'll do, if you're willing to stay, is I'll just go ahead and wrap up this webinar and make sure we give away the, uh, the books to the winners. And then we can circle back at 2 o'clock and start answering some additional questions that have been submitted. And that way, if people need to leave, they can just go. But um, we'll, we can stay for a little longer and answer some additional questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for this. It's terrific. Um, you know, my son was, he's 25 now, and back, way back when, there was neither clear nor concise information about Section 504. It was a big mystery. And to be able to have a resource like this for parents to be able to listen to and to really learn more about how the 504 process works is just so, so invaluable. So thank you so much. I also want to remind everyone here, if you're not familiar, Laurel did a wonderful introduction to Section 504 and individualized health care plans in January, and we have that recorded as a webinar as well. So if you need more fundamentals of what 504 is all about, um, in addition to just your legal rights under Section 504, we will be including a link to that recorded webinar in the follow-up email all of you will receive in a couple of days. Um, so I'm going to move ahead with the giveaways. Um, we're going to give away two copies of um, Colette Martin's new book. It's coming out. I think it, it's actually started being delivered before the scheduled date of September 9th. Um, but it, we have two winners, and those winners who will receive a copy of this wonderful book are Wendy Dunn and Jan Lee. So congratulations to both of you. Um, we are going to be in possession of the books in about a week, and then we will send them out to you directly. So just hang in there for another week or so, and then we'll get them off in the mail. But we will be following up by email with you to confirm that we have your contact information correctly. Um, and then some other things I want to tell you about if you're in the greater Philadelphia area. Our um, big event of the year is our Strides for Safe Kids Mall Walk-In Expo, and that's going to be September 7th at Plymouth Meeting Mall. If you want to know more about it to register, we'd love for you to be there to join us. It's at stridesforsafekids.org. Um, and let's see, our next webinar is going to be on September 23rd, and if you have not yet heard about the Food Allergy Management and Education or FAME Toolkit, that is what our webinar in September is going to be on. It's tools and wonderful resources to assist schools in the management of life-threatening food allergies. So if you are an educator or a school nurse, you can log in to our webinar in September to find out more about this uh, this toolkit and how you can use this free resource. And if you are a parent, you can find out more about this so you can utilize it yourself or share it with your school. Um, the director of the program for the Food Allergy Management Education from St. Louis Children's Hospital, um, Kathleen McDarby, is going to be doing the presentation along with Dr. Michael Pissner from allergyhome.org. So it should be a good um, session, and I hope that you can join us. So in wrapping up, I just want to tell you that Kids with Food Allergies um, is a well, it, we really enjoy putting on these webinars, and we're part of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the nation's oldest and largest asthma and allergy charity. Um, if you found today's webinar valuable, um, please keep KFA in your um, end of the year giving plans. We really appreciate your financial support and rely on our donors to keep our program offerings for families so rich and valuable. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and then 
um, I'll just consider this the official cutoff. It's right at 2 o'clock, so we're ending on time, and then we're going to hang around and answer some more questions at this point. I'm going to stop for just a couple of seconds so we can stop the recording in case, um, in case Melanie, who's doing our technical stuff, uh, needs to stop it for uh, whatever reason. <laughs>